Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we take old creatures from past editions of D&D and other tabletop games, bring them to light, explore how cool and awesome they are, and then convert them to 5th edition so that you can use them in your current D&D campaigns. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are talking about a very special monster from 3rd edition. I mean, technically 3.5, but do we round up or down? I can never remember. Anyways, today we are here to talk about the Siege Crab, which comes to us originally from the Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 Monster Manual 3. This creature is exactly what it sounds like. It is a gargantuan crab that is used for laying siege to underwater and coastal cities. So what's so special about a giant crab, aside from the fact that it's a giant crab? It's not just a giant crab, I mean it definitely is that, but it's also had parts of its body surgically altered to make it a more effective living weapon. Through various magics and surgical procedures, this crab has been transformed into effectively a living tank. It can house creatures inside of a compartment in its shell, and it's also got all kinds of magical wards placed upon it and a few supernatural abilities to boot. These guys are terrifying to go up against and awesome to have on your side. They can provide this really interesting central focal point to an otherwise pretty big battle, and I'm really excited to talk about them today. So the first thing that we're going to do is go over just exactly what this thing can do in combat, what its abilities are, and then we're going to move on and talk about some plot hooks and ways that you can actually use it in your campaign. And as always, I have converted this creature into 5th edition, so there's a stat block in the description below in the form of a Google document, which you can find there and use that if you want to follow along while we're talking about it, or just at the end of the video if you think this creature sounds cool and you want to use it, everything you need to run it is right there. But without further delay, let's take a look at some... So here's this giant enemy crab. Before we even get into the specifics of the siege crab and how it works on the battlefield, we need to understand exactly how its controller can command it. See, each one of these things is magically raised from birth to be a siege weapon, and part of that magical process involves the creation of a coral circlet that a user can wear on their head, and if they're wearing that, they can convey commands to the crab telepathically and it will do its best to obey them. One important distinction here is it's not like a golem that can be given conditional commands or like programs where stand over there if something gets within 30 feet attack it or something like that it can only do things in the here and now and direct simple commands that it can follow go destroy this go attack that but the coral circlet is not bound to a specific creature any creature can put it on and use it and as long as they're on the same plane of existence as the siege crab it's going to obey their commands Think of the Coral Circlet as like a pair of keys to a really nice car. Except the car also has numerous legs and four massive claws. Speaking of which, I should mention that unlike typical crabs, this thing also has four claws. And it can use those claws to do exactly what you think. It can grab things, it can slash at things, and it can crush things. This guy gets four claw attacks per turn, and any larger, smaller creature that gets hit by one of its claws is grappled. But if you're familiar with my stat blocks, you'll know that I think that things that just grapple are a little bit boring, so I've given it an ability I call Crush, which is basically a melee attack it can make against a creature that it already has grappled. So instead of making a regular claw attack, if it's already got someone grappled in that claw, it can do a little bit of extra damage, and they have to make another saving throw, and if they fail, then the creature that's in the crab's claw is also restrained now. Meaning that if this thing gets a hold of you, you want to try to get away from it before it has a chance to really start crushing down on you. The other attack the siege crab has at its disposal is an action called trample, which allows it to move up to 60 feet in a straight line using its movement to do so, and any creature that is large or smaller in that area has to make a saving throw or be knocked prone, and regardless of whether they make the save or not, they're pushed out of the crab space and they're going to take some damage. So that should start to paint a picture about how this crab fights. It's basically just going to be obeying commands, grabbing people, smashing buildings. It's trying to break through the front line, basically, so that the rest of the army can then follow through because it's a siege crab. They use it for laying siege to things. Makes sense. But the coolest thing about this creature isn't actually what it can do by itself in combat, it's what it facilitates other creatures to be able to do in combat. 
As I mentioned, the crab has a sealed compartment which has been built into its shell. This compartment is about 10 by 10 and it's only accessible through a hatch that is on the crab's underside. So this thing can be operated by one large creature or up to four medium creatures. And while they're in there, they have full cover and they also gain some magical benefits because this crab's shell has been ingrained with these ancient runes and stuff. So that benefit actually passes on to any creatures that are inside of the compartment that has been carved into the crab. Meaning that creatures inside the crab are going to get a big bonus to their armor class and be impossible to hit with ranged attacks. And these magical runes aren't just a flat AC bonus either. The crab has an armor class of 20, which is pretty substantial. This is factoring in these magical bonuses. But it's also under the effect of a shield-like spell, so it's immune to magic missile, which is kind of a niche ability, but it might come up. This magical shielding also prevents incorporeal creatures from passing through the crab's shell, which means any ghosts or other incorporeal monsters won't be able to get in. And it also means that anyone trying to use magic to pass inside the crab through the ethereal plane or something like that will not be able to do so either. Now, the magic on this shell is too powerful to be dispelled by a simple dispel magic, but if dispel magic or a similar effect is cast on the crab, it does suppress the bonuses that the shell gives for 1d4 rounds. So if your players are going up against this thing, they can use dispel magic to try to get a few extra hits in. The last thing I want to talk about here is one final bit of information about that coral circlet. Any creature who's wearing that circlet is able to cast spells as if they were originating from the crab itself. What that means is that you can have a spellcaster inside the crab who's directing it and controlling it, and that same spellcaster can also be casting like disintegration rays and all kinds of different magic in all directions around them while the crab is tearing shit up as well. That's pretty powerful, not to mention the fact that the user can also see through the crab's eyes if it wants to suppress its own eyesight. So if a wizard or something is wearing the circlet, you've basically got this giant familiar that can also function as a battle tank. That's pretty cool. All the rules for how this works are extremely specific and all laid out very clearly in the stat block. So if you have any edge cases or nitty gritty questions, I'm sure the answer is in there. But the bottom line is essentially you can have a wizard slinging spells while in the protection of the crab's carapace with three other guys ready to jump out and start attacking people if anyone gets close. This monster is super cool and I think it has a lot of potential to shake up any big battles that might be happening in your campaign sometime soon. But on that note, let's move away from combat and talk about some... The origin of the siege crab depends very much on which setting we're talking about here, but the one thing that remains consistent across all D&D worlds is that siege crabs are creatures created for the purpose of warfare bred from a very young age to effectively be these living bioweapons. The original story is that the Kuatoa, the fish people who live in the Underdark, bred these creatures for warfare. And the way they would use them is exactly how I described before. You'd have your battle priest inside this thing casting spells whenever a good opportunity presented itself, and a few warriors ready to jump out and fight at any given moment. There are also stories of Sahuagin using these things to wage war against land dwellers that would dare settle near their coastal cities. I can't imagine anything more terrifying or more bombastic to start off a big combat against a bunch of Sahuagin than seeing a few legions of them coming out of the water with one or two of these massive crabs that just start tearing apart the city's defenses. And that's a great way that you can use these creatures is to give your players a pivotal and that's a great way you can use these creatures is to give your players a pivotal role in mass combat. Running big gigantic battles with huge armies is very tricky in Dungeons and Dragons. You can do it, but if you don't want it to turn into a giant slog, you have to be a little bit smart about how you plan those encounters. I actually did a video about this a ways back that you can check out if you actually are planning on running a mass combat, but one of the things I talked about in that video was giving your players a smaller goal that will impact the overall battle. And there's no better opportunity than the siege crab to do something like that. If you put up 10,000 Sahuagin marching into the city, your players can't really do a lot against that unless they're crazy high level, in which case it doesn't really matter anyways. But if the city defenses are mostly holding against this invasion, however the attack is being spearheaded by a siege crab that is 
starting to tear down the walls, that's a great opportunity for your players to intervene being the heroes and they're gonna go take that thing out. And who knows, if they're able to figure out how it works and get the Coral Circlet away from its controller, maybe they can even turn it on their enemies if they don't kill it first. Another really neat way that these crabs can be used is as like companion animals to a storm giant. They're CR12, which is right around the same area that you're going to be using storm giants in your campaign anyway. So rather than having maybe two storm giants, maybe have a storm giant and a siege crab paired up together. The storm giant might even be wearing the coral circlet, not as a circlet, but like a ring on its finger or something. And it could use it almost like a hunting dog, like to route out its opponents. Once they're out in the open, then it can just start casting lightning bolts at them. And I mean, storm giants can cast some magic, maybe it's even casting spells through the crab. Why put itself in danger when it has access to this much tankier creature? No pun intended. I would also be remiss if I did not at least mention the tritons in the world of Theros. If you are running a Theros campaign, a siege crab is a no-brainer addition to the triton people. The whole triton culture is all about, like using sea animals in place of like beasts of burden the way that the land dwellers do so having a giant crab that has been bred for warfare is an awesome idea even if it's not a combat that your players are going up against just as something that like exists in that city that your players see maybe while they're going through the triton capital or something they see squadrons of triton soldiers marching down with like one or two of these siege crabs with them also once again you can always change it up to suit your needs as well if you want one of these things to function more like an actual apc that can carry like 20 guys just expand the compartment and make the crab colossal in size just make it bigger you literally don't have to change anything about it. Just make it bigger and give it like a 20 by 30 compartment so that it can house a bunch of soldiers so that maybe it gets into the city, the hatch opens up, and then all these guys start pouring out. And if you wanted to just use it as a one-off encounter that wasn't part of some great war-like combat, maybe your players just come across this thing and it's completely inert and they don't really get how it works. And if they can find the Coral Circlet, they can make use of it. It could be a really great, like, home base kind of for an undersea adventure. Or maybe some local bandits happened upon the aftermath of a battle and they found the coral circlet and they've been using it for their own ends. If the original owners of the crab aren't complete jerks, like maybe they're tritons for example, if you return it back to them there could be a great reward for doing such a thing. After all, siege crabs do take a lot of time and energy to create. But however you use this thing, it's sure to leave a lasting impression on your players, which is always a good thing in my books. And as I said, if you do want to use it, the stat block is in the description below this video. You can find it all there. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons, the whole two page this time stat block with the monster manual styling and all the different uh, plot hooks and that kind of thing written in there with the artwork is available on the Patreon page. That's pretty much all I got for giant crabs today, so thank you so much for watching. I truly do appreciate it, and I will catch y'all in the next one. Until then. Okay.